What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Obviously, there's fucking nowhere else I could possibly be right now. I want to talk to y'all today. I want to preach today about these sophomore running backs. Because sophomore running backs, they're a fucking enigma in themselves. That's not just pertaining to this year's crop in particular. That is the overall theme of sophomore running backs. Because... As we know, running back production spikes within the first, their rookie contract, right? The first two, three, four years of their playing time, which is why NFL teams don't want to sign them afterwards, right? Because their body's bruised. They've already given you their elite production years. We know that the age apex for a running back is 24 and a half for their fantasy football life. Now, some of y'all might have not known that, and that's a ridiculous fucking number because you consider someone who's 25 to be relatively young. And I'm old as shit at 27. And uh, that's a scary, scary fact, knowing that NFL... I'm wiped out in the NFL. Nobody's giving my ass a contract in the NFL. No one's giving 25-year-old contracts to running backs anymore. So we need to hit on them in fantasy when they're in their youth. Sophomore running backs, man. They're coming off this rookie season where they went into an offense and they produced at a certain level, right? And the second year is usually where we see players make elite jumps. If you don't hit on them, though, you use a lot of draft capital because with a lot of the sophomore running backs, you actually haven't seen them do it on the field yet, right? You're projecting into the future. You're hoping that they take that next step and become elite for your fantasy team. However, with running backs and the way that fantasy football works nowadays, you got to pay up for running backs. You don't get... You know, you don't get that second year running back who's exciting with tons of upside in the fourth or fifth round anymore. Right. That's where you get their That's where you get their rookie year. That's where they're usually drafted during their rookie year. You don't get that anymore. So I think we need to dive into these sophomore running backs in particular, you know, the Josh Jacobs, the Miles Sanders, David Montgomery's, those guys. And just break down how we see the whole world of fantasy playing out in relation to these young kings. If you guys are watching this on Thursday, we have a couple more exciting pieces of content coming out today. We have narrowed down the intern search. So we're hiring two interns for the BDGE team for the summer, quarantine accepting. And we've got it down to the final three. We are interviewing the final three today. I will be live streaming the interviews, 12 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Eastern time and 5 p.m. Eastern time. The final three candidates will be getting interviewed, video interviewed by myself live on YouTube. I'm going to stream it. So make sure you set your fucking calendars, tuck your shirts in, stop yelling and join me for that. We will have special guest interviewers. We got some of my friends. We got some of the big dogs teams and we've got some other surprises up our sleeve that I think a lot of y'all in this audience will certainly appreciate so we got sophomore running backs right now intern interviews later today the one other question i got for you and i need y'all to comment this how are we feeling about this setup i don't think i've ever done a video where it was just plain me like from straight away but it's a really easy setup for me i don't know if you guys are gonna fuck with it though i usually do it from the sides and i kind of like that angle a little bit but it looks a little weird when i set it up in the new headquarters that way And most of y'all probably don't even give a fuck. But these are the things that I think about when I'm setting up my video content. I'm like, yo, I think you guys like the setup that I've always had for this. And maybe makes you feel a little homely, makes you feel here with me. Maybe I'm just a fucking weirdo and none of this matters at all. But I would really, honestly, if you do anything today, I would really appreciate letting me know how you uh, how you like this setup. If there's something I could do better with the setup. I know the artwork was obviously set up so that if I was from the side, you would be able to see this a lot better and it would make a lot more sense and things would look better behind me. But, you know, if it looks good this way, if you guys like the straight up talk to talk face to face, you know, showing the love this way, then I can mess around with the shit behind me and move it. But if y'all want to go back to the other way, then I I could probably do that as well. So please let me know in the comment section down below. Again, don't yell. Tuck your damn shirt in. Let's eat. One more quick thing to add in here. Next week is the NFL Draft. One week from today, me and the Bunk Bed Breakdown boys, Noah and Mike, will be live streaming the entire draft, probably all three nights. Definitely the first two nights. We'll see if we even want to fucking get into rounds four through seven. So put that into your calendar. We will be live streaming the entire first round, the entire second round, if you want to listen to those fucking clowns on TV. V, y'all can listen to your clowns on YouTube. Running back number one, we're going to talk about Josh Jacobs, of course. He was the 24th overall pick for the Raiders last year. First round, the NFL draft, current ADP. So I'm taking ADP from FFPC, which does high stakes leagues. So these ADPs are highly accurate as of right now, how the market views these guys. 
He is currently the 13th pick overall, the 201 RB10. So my thoughts on Jacob coming into the league are, are, are well known to my audience at this point. Again, I covered it in last month's video I did where I talked about the top 10 lessons learned from last fantasy football season, which I think was a super valuable video. So if y'all missed that one, make sure you go watch it. It's basically an hour long of me kind of shitting on myself and trying to help you out with all the fuck ups that I had last year. Josh Jacobs, subpar athleticism combined with lack of workhorse pedigree going back to college. Those are my concerns. He showed us that his athleticism metrics didn't matter whatsoever. Not a fucking kilo bit. I'd be honest though. The volume still worries me a little bit because we never saw him handle the workload in college. And then as soon as he got it in the NFL, he got hurt. Dude was banged up last year. He's looking like snacks running the 40 time, coming in and out, limping out of games. His ankle was hurt. His knee was hurt, whatever, whatever, whatever. He eventually missed three games. So played in 13 out of 16 games. Welcome to being a fucking running back in the NFL. The problem was this. I should have been far more open to the straight up overall volume argument for Josh Jacobs last year. The same argument that I'm making for DeAndre Swift that you'll hear me make in tomorrow's Fade the Public video and you've heard me make already. He was a first round pick. And as the first running back off the board, we already know this, right? I made this little chart for y'all. We're looking at running backs who were the first running back picked in the NFL draft. And we're looking at their volume in that rookie year. So I went back the last 10 years, right? All the way back to 2011. Maybe that's nine years. I don't fucking know. I forget how to count sometimes. And I looked at all the ones that were first round picks. So if we look at any NFL running back that was the first running back picked in that particular NFL draft year, but they were also first round picks, right? You see in 2014 and 2013, Bishop Sankey and Gio Bernard, both monster busts in the NFL from a an elite fantasy running back perspective and both of them were picked in the second round so the draft capital as we already know is a huge 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 difference maker when it comes to fantasy I mean just look at the last five years the first running back off the board Jacobs Barkley Fournette Zeke Todd Gurley Trent Richardson in 2012 Mark Ingram in 2011 the only one of those who was the first running back picked off the board with first round draft capital that averaged fewer than 19.2 touches per game in that first rookie season was Mark Ingram all the way back in 2011. Mark Ingram went into a situation where it was Darren Sproles in his prime and they had Pierre Thomas, who both of them, I, I believe, combined for over 130 receptions that year. So he wasn't really involved in the passing game work. So you look at the touches per game on the right side and basically every running back who's the first running back picked off the board with first round draft capital averages around 20 touches per game, man. If not more, 23, we're seeing up there, 22, 23.6. So if DeAndre Swift is the first running back off the board in the first round, I'm expecting volume type numbers similar to these. So had I seen that chart, I probably would have been more open to the Josh Jacobs volume argument. Listen, you live and you learn and you take these lessons with you into the following fantasy year. But again, Jacobs was not just a volume guy. The dude was the dude was really fucking good on the volume that he had. Right. He went from over thirteen hundred yards from scrimmage which if you do the math, 13 games, 1,300 yards scrimmage, over 100 yards from scrimmage per game, he had five five individual games of over 100 plus rushing yards. It's tied with guys like Dalvin Cook and Aaron Jones. He ranked top 10 in the NFL in yards per carry, around 4.8 yards after contact per attempt, around 3.5. And probably the craziest stat of them all, probably the craziest stat of them all, he led all running backs last year in broken tackles forced, despite missing three games. So the running backs that played 16 games still did not make as many missed tackles happen in the backfield as Josh Jacobs did, despite missing three games. And his efficiency there, if we're talking about missed tackles per rushing attempt, he led the entire NFL, obviously, as well. But the gap, the disparity there was even more so. And the biggest question mark, depending on whether or not you side with me on like the health thing, it's not that I, th I think the the health is a question mark or a negative for Jacobs. It's the fact that when I see guys enter the NFL that haven't ever handled the full workload at a college level makes me question whether or not they could do it at the NFL. Not that they've been hurt, but the fact that we haven't seen them do it. So it's it's not a negative. It's just not a positive in his favor, if that makes sense. So that was, that's a, a minor red flag I would hold against him. But the other thing that we all obviously think about and want to know whether or not they're going to do it Jacobs this year in Oakland is get him more involved in the passing game right that's going to be the difference between whether he finishes again where he did last year or he takes that jump up to like the top five top three fantasy running backs in the NFL he might not have had the volume at Alabama he might not have had the passing volume for the Raiders last year in his rookie season but he is smooth as fuck in the receiving game so I, I will talk about that in a second a little bit more but another I just want to talk about another overlooked part of this offense is the offensive line man they uh they were not a line that I expected to be very good coming into last year but they were the sixth 
ranked run blocking line per football outsiders in 2019 so not only was jacobs awesome was he efficient was he making guys miss on his own but the line is also giving him some fucking leverage giving him some push and making holes and making things happen for him you got josh jacobs's skill you got his volume you got his workload you got this offensive line making holes for him jacobs is in line for an absolutely fucking monster year i'm not gonna hold against him all the bullshit that i said last year and if i didn't like him as a prospect that's out the door you got to be able to pivot you got to be able to change your mind so then you could look at the weapons around him you could look at this however you want right you could say jacobs didn't have a lot of passing work and they didn't have anyone to pass the ball too so he should have had a little bit more or you could look at it and say this offense can only improve on the in the passing game right last year it was like literally darren waller you had tyrell williams banged up for almost the entire year you had hunter renfro come on very very late in the season here's what i think we're gonna get a full dose of Hunt, hunter renfro this year darren waller is gonna ball out again as he should because he's a great fucking athlete and everyone fading him this year as like a top 10 tight end should be a fucking shame to themselves tyrell williams will be healthy hopefully and the raiders will go with the wide receiver in the first round is it jerry judy is it cd lamb we don't know but they got an early, early, early pick. Well, early where the wide receiver should be targeted. So this passing game, despite who's at quarterback, whether or not you think they're shitty, should be a lot better because they have a lot of other weapons where it gets a little bit tricky, a little bit dicey. The only other running back on the roster right now is Jalen Richard, who the Raiders just resigned to a two-year $7.5 million extension. And yes, he will be a trusted piece of this offense as he has been for the last fucking 32 years. And he will remain involved in the passing game. But, but... He's not a monster factor in this passing game, okay? While Jacobs was on the field, so the 13 games that Jacobs was on the field, Richard only averaged two and a half targets per game. Two and a half targets per game while Jacobs was on the field. DeAndre Washington is gone to free agency. So that alone should free up more passing game work, right? That's 40 targets right there going elsewhere. So two and a half targets per game for Richard while Jacobs was on the field equates to 40 targets. DeAndre Washington's 40 targets are gone. Josh Jacobs got about 28 or 30 targets last year. So even if those are split, right? Even if even if 25 of those targets go over to Richard and 15 of them go over to Josh Jacobs on top of what he had last year, you're looking at a guy who's getting between 43 to 45 targets. But what you love to see Mike Mayock coming out here and talking up Josh Jacobs about heavily involving him in the passing game next season. As we read from Motor World, Mayock referred to it as phase two for the 22 year old sophomore follow-up. Any involvement as a receiver out of the backfield would be considered an upgrade to Jacobs' 27 targets. But basically they're coming out and they're saying, that they want to get Josh Jacobs a lot more involved. And that is straight from the fucking Hefe GM's mouth. Now, they drafted him with a plan. They drafted him in the first round last year. You have long-term future visions of how you want to use him. They didn't want to open up the playbook too much to him last year. They didn't want to put too much on the plate. They knew he was a great runner. And they said, fuck it, we're going to let you run. Now, we're going to integrate you more into the passing game. We're going to in integrate you more into the pass blocking schemes and stuff that we have. So that's what you love to see. Now, I don't listen to much coach speak, let alone GM speak, who really does is not going to be the one calling the plays or telling players to get on the field and whatnot but when there's smoke there's usually fire so we need to continue to hear reports from from Gruden from Mayock from Derek Carr or whatever that Josh Jacobs is going to be heavily involved in the passing game and if that is the case that's when you start to buy into this shit right Jacobs is a guy where y'all know I was not sold on him last year but I will be heavily investing into Jacobs especially if I can get Jacobs as my second round pick, right? Right now he's going as a 13th overall. So at the 201, I'll be ecstatic if Jacobs is my RB2. Say you you mash that, you know, the 12 and 13 spot, you got fucking Nick Chubb and Josh Jacobs, or you get Joe Mixon and Josh Jacobs, or even if you take your wide receiver one with one of them and Josh Jacobs, right? That's a that's a nice right, uh, running back one. It's a nice wide receiver one. Right now, points bet currently has Jacobs' is over under set at 1,650 total yards from scrimmage. He's as good a bet as anyone, maybe not Derrick Henry, to finish as a top five rusher in the NFL. After what we saw him do last year, if he could stay healthy, I really think he's going to get a lot more involved in the passing game. I don't think that's just smoke up our asses. So Jacobs getting 40 receptions this year, 45 receptions this year, plus 250, 270 carries will land him inside the top five fantasy running back. So Jacobs needs to be on your target list. No doubt about it. Good offensive pieces, good offensive line, good player getting involved in all three downs. It doesn't have to be difficult. Josh Jacobs, not difficult. Miles Sanders, a lot more difficult. Philadelphia Eagles running back, picking the second round last year, 53rd overall. Current ADP, the 211 spot. So he's getting picked 23rd overall as the running back 13. So he's only three rankings behind Josh Jacobs in positional rankings, but he's about 12 or 10 picks behind him in the overall rankings. So Sanders, I think, is going to be the one, uh, one of the most 
talked about slash controversial running backs to pick this year in fantasy for the entirety of the summer. We're going to hear a lot of arguments for him, a lot of arguments against them, and for good reason. I don't think a lot of people realize that Miles Sanders actually finished his rookie season with more total yards from scrimmage than Josh Jacobs did because of that ridiculous run over the second half of the year, right? Sanders finished with 1,327 yards from scrimmage, Jacobs 1,316. And yes, Sanders played three more games than Jacobs. You could use that as an argument, but Jacobs had 33 more touches than Sanders did. And this is a quote from Roto World. Sanders ultimately joined Gale Sayers, Marshall Falk, Edron James, and Saquon Barkley, among others, as one of just seven rookies in league history to account for 800 rushing yards and 500 receiving yards. When we look at the situation, you ask yourself, running back by committee or Sanders is too good to be stuck in there. The Eagles and Doug Peterson did fucking everything in their power to keep Sanders in that running back by committee for as long as they possibly could. It took literally a Jordan Howard injury in week nine for them to finally hand the keys over to this stud. But as soon as they did, Sanders fucking crushed it. And if you're looking at the game splits here from Rotoviz, in split, these first nine games is from weeks one to nine. And then as soon as Jordan Howard got hurt, Look at the jump up in half PPR points and PPR points and standard points. Receptions go up from 2.4 to 4. His touchdowns go up from 0.22 per game to 0.58. So he's scoring more than a, a touchdown every other game. His involvement in every aspect just shot up, right? Over those last seven weeks, we're talking about almost 19 touches per game with four of them coming through the air. We're talking about realistic top 10 fantasy running back numbers over that stretch. And I know... Y'all love the talent of Sanders. We all do. He's explosive. He's got the size. He can break away runs. We saw him take a fucking like 60-yard reception to the crib last year. That is a piece of his game that he could absolutely do. And I did have him ranked above Jacobs in my rookie drafts last year. But there are two big red flags that I see with Sanders entering 2019. It's the chicken or the egg. Doug Peterson wants to use a running back by committee no matter how bad fantasy players want to. Sanders to be the featured workhorse. Here's why I consider it a red flag. Even if you're in the camp that Sanders is too good to be put into a committee or he's never had a back like Sanders, which is an argument that I've made and it worked out last season as soon as they let him fucking have the reins. The, the problem is you don't know that for a fact. You don't know if they're going to use an RBBC. So even if you like Sanders and that is your argument for it, you still have to have the awareness to acknowledge that it's possible that you're wrong and Peterson is going to use him in a running back by committee. So no matter how talented he is, if he's a 16 to 17 touch guy, his ceiling is very, very limited in this offense in terms of the elite other running backs that you're probably getting around the same range so with Sanders you have to be able to acknowledge that there are both sides there's a there's a range of outcomes there's a spectrum to where Sanders is going to land in fantasy football for next year and you have to factor that into the draft spot you don't just say it's either going to be one or the other it's either going to be best case scenario or it's either going to be worst case scenario and I will only draft basing on which one of those sides of the spectrum I feel like he's going to be at, right? We can only go off of Doug Peterson's time as a head coach in Philly because he was under Andy Reid as the, you know, people always go back, what about Jamal Charles and KC? Like, it wasn't fucking Doug Peterson's offense. Andy Reid was there. He was the one running the offense. It wasn't like Doug Peterson's like, well, take a seat, Andy, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the show uh, for the next uh, five or six years, and I'm going to let Jamal Charles run wild. Andy Reid literally ran that fucking offense. So Doug Peterson, going back to the Jamal Charles years, is a waste of fucking time, and it's bad analysis. So don't listen to people who do that shit. You can only look at Peterson's time in Philadelphia. Sanders' 179 carries last year were the most by any running back in the four years that Peterson has served as the head coach. So he has never had a running back in his four years there. That's a pretty big sample size. Go over 179 carries. The RB1 in his offense over those four years has averaged 157 carries. Again, it's the chicken or the egg. Do you believe that he's never had a back as talented as Miles Sanders? Which I do believe to be the case, but the two are not mutually exclusive. That could be the case, and they could still use a running back by committee. The other red flag I see, and this is more of a nitpicking kind of argument, but much of Sanders' fantasy success over the second half of the year came through the air. And when you look at what Philly provided to Carson Wentz, in the passing game, like their weapons were absolute dog shit. I mean, look at everybody that got hurt on that team. Deshaun Jackson, Alshon Jeffrey, Jordan Howard, Darren Sproles. I mean, by season's end, they were fielding like probably the worst personnel group of wide receivers or just overall weapons in the entire NFL. I'm shocked that they made absolutely zero moves to address the position in free agency, but we're going to see them attack this position in the NFL draft, obviously. I think their first round pick is without without a doubt going to be targeting a, uh, a wide receiver. When players are healthy, right, and you're adding these new pieces to the offense, whether they're getting healthy or whether you're drafting first round rookie wide receivers, you're adding new pieces to the offense. And does that mean that Sanders is 
receiving numbers are going to dip. Most likely, but does that mean he can't still catch 50 passes? No, it also doesn't, right? Sanders had 63 targets last year. He turned those into 50 receptions and 500 receiving yards. That's that's a hefty number. That's a big number to tack on to whatever rushing total that you have. If he could do that again, being his second year as the main running back in this Eagles offense, that's that that's something I could see happen. But listen, Boston Scott is still there. Boston Scott, the God, is still there and will likely serve as a weapon in this offense too. Regardless of what you think about Boston Scott or what you think about Miles Sanders, Boston Scott is still creeping. Now, the question becomes, how much of an increase in carries does he get? I mean, he had 179 last year, and that was while Jordan Howard was there for the first nine games and saw over 13 carries a game. Sanders averaged 11.2 per game on the season. I do think we can expect a slight increase, a slight uptick with Jordan Howard out of the picture. Maybe, you know, 12, 13, 13 and a half-ish per game. Realistically, how many ca- how many passes is he going to catch? If he's getting 13 and a half carries per game, let's say uh, three and a half receptions per game, which is a pretty hefty number. That ever ends up being like 55 receptions on the season. I think that's a realistic number for him. So if he's getting 14 carries plus, you know, three and a half receptions per game, the question becomes, do you like a Miles Sanders getting 16 to 18 touches per game Or do you like someone else around the same spot that has a little bit more upside? Is the upside there for Sanders to get more touches? Yeah, probably. But I'm in the category that if I'm leaning one way or the other, where it's going to be full workhorse or running back by committee, I'm definitely in the middle with a little more hesitation towards a running back by committee. So my take right now is I won't be drafting Miles Sanders in the second round of drafts right now. We'll see what they do in the draft. We'll see you know, what the chatter is out of Philly throughout the offseason and if they are going to be using him as a workhorse. This is going to be a tough, uh, a really tough offseason to kind of pick up on these notes because we're not going to have a lot of time where they're physically together and these beat reporters and training camp. And, you know, there's a lot of time for us to get these sources coming at us because we're seeing them on the field because they're not going to be on the field for a lot of the time. So this is really important to dive into these numbers and and look at it realistically and use a range of spectrums when you are drafting because we're not going to get a lot of the uh, luxuries that we been used to over the previous years so we got josh jacobs love him got miles sanders love the player not sure if i absolutely love using a second round pick on him right now let's move on to david montgomery someone we are absolutely not using a second round pick on and if you use a second round pick on him last year you're a fucking moron who is it david montgomery are you serious the live chat's going nuts right now first off you guys can talk all the shit you want about David Montgomery. If you can't see the potential, Jordan Howard for last year was a second round pick. Fat fuck, horrible. They moved up and got this guy. He's like a fucking Barry Sanders. What is wrong with you? Open your fuck here. Use my glasses, assholes. Cause you can't see that. Talk all the shit you want. These people in the draft room, they're retarded. They're just not good. They're not. Sorry. They watch the fantasy counts. Horrible. I'm going to fucking destroy this league. It's a wrap. I like David Montgomery as a prospect coming out. Maybe at end of fourth round is something I probably could have dove into, but gladly I didn't take him anywhere. By nearly all accounts, right, David Montgomery was a bust during his rookie season because in almost every league, you did have a guy that reached for him in the third or even the second round. I I think he's worth diving into a little bit more than just saying he looked bad on the field or the Bears were terrible. If you look at it from a raw numbers outlook, he definitely wasn't efficient and he did look sluggish a lot at times, but he still went for nearly a 1100 total yards and seven touchdowns during his rookie season right if you look at melvin gordon's rookie season he had far far worse numbers than that Le'Veon bells was not much better either and david montgomery did that behind the 29th ranked offensive line run blocking line and absolutely abysmal fucking quarterback play they're going to have more consistency with nick Foles under quarterback who i'm assuming is going to be the starting quarterback right now he's got odds of i believe one fifth minus 150 to be the week one starter in Chicago. Depending on what happens with the offensive line, I like Nick Foles being there as a QB to give the offense overall a little bit more consistency, and we're not going to see as many runs from Foles as we would from Trubisky. It's very, 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 very possible that the Chicago Bears go out and they take someone in the draft, fuck the whole backfield up, right? Some kind of cog in the offense that's an offensive playmaker, someone like Antonio Gibson, 
out of Memphis who I fucking love and someone like Lynn Bowden who can be like a receiver or running back or just a weapon overall and that would take a lot of the carries away because I don't know if they see David Montgomery as a three down guy maybe when they drafted him they did but I don't know if they still view him that way I don't know if he has that ceiling anymore it's a tricky situation but I don't think it's something that we should necessarily give up on so quick so am I out on Montgomery completely as a running back no I think it would be irresponsible of me to tell you to get the fuck out if you own him I would be looking to sell for the right price but I'm not selling low if we're talking about redraft though his current ADP is way too high for me he's going off the board 50th overall so 502 running back 24. It's not that I don't think he could return value on that, but when you look at the guys going around him, this is the ADP from FFPC. David Montgomery at that 50 spot. Look at the dudes in front of him. AJ Brown, Cup, Sor- Sutton, Thielen. Those are the four wide receivers with the four picks in front of him. There's a good chance that one of those guys is on the board still when David Montgomery is your pick at 50. And I would not even think twice about taking Montgomery underneath those dudes. I would take Mark Ingram, who's right behind him over him. I would probably take Damian Williams over Montgomery as well. You have Stephon Diggs behind him, which eh, I don't know. Dobbins' ADP will rise up and he'll be above Montgomery if he gets drafted early. And even the ones down at 59, 60, 61, Robert Woods, DJ Chark, Tyler Lockett, I would probably take all those over David Montgomery too. So in terms of relativity to the other guys getting picked around him, David Montgomery seems to be a really, really bad pick. This is, this is, I know it seems crazy to start putting out videos like this this early and i hope you guys are enjoying it or getting some value from it if you did make sure you smash that fucking thumbs up button the reason i do it is so that i can track the trends throughout the entire offseason right this is what i i look at david montgomery right now where he's getting picked and i'm like no way i would be taking a running back in that fifth round with all those wide receivers and knowing that these wide receivers are going to be there in the fourth or fifth rounds of drafts makes me tailor my draft strategy right makes me look at what i need to be doing in best ball drafts where i'm actually drafting for money right now and stuff so it's like attacking the running backs very early right getting your first two studs either in the first and second round first and third round whatever because in rounds four five six you can grab a ridley a sutton uh dj chark and have them as your wide receiver one two and three looking at how the trends are working out right now is something that i try to heavily focus on and give y'all my perspective from one of the pieces of my draft guide which is on sale for pre-order pricing right now you can go over to bigdogsdraftguide.com slash m k f to cop that for ten dollars you get the rookie dynasty guide and the season-long guide in the season-long guide i do what we call the big dog bible so i do this monster write-up like eight thousand to ten thousand words each position broken down position by position talking exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft from a strategy standpoint from a player standpoint like which rounds you should be drafting which guys and like how to maneuver your draft from every position it's a monster article i write it's one of my favorite pieces to write over the entirety of the offseason and it takes me a long time to do it and a lot of the time i include all the trends that i see throughout the summer why you should be attacking those trends or where you should be fading the trends and whatnot so it makes your draft very 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 simple for y'all but there's so much more in the draft guide there's you know top sleepers top busts must draft players all the rankings dynasty rankings rookie rankings season long rankings ppr fucking standard half ppr redraft super flex toenail pop man pop super pop all that fucking shit bigdogdraftguide.com if you are not eligible to play monkey knife fight if you're one of the states that they don't allow you can just cop it from the regular site if not bigdogdraftguide.com slash mkf ten dollars you get the season long guide and you get the rookie dynasty guide i love y'all let's move on to devin stingletary baby devin pringletary is what i actually called him last year because once he popped the fun does not fucking stop he was my favorite 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 running back on tape ran that disgusting 40 came in at such a small size third round pick last year 74th overall current adp 30th overall 310 running back 18 so he is six picks behind miles sanders singletary is also another really intriguing running back for fantasy football in 2020 right he comes in as a rookie looks super super efficient incredible on the field the the tackle breaking ability that he showed in college unlike david montgomery shined right through onto the nfl field but he continued to split time with the timeless Frank Gore in that Buffalo backfield. Now, Singletary missed three games from weeks three to six last year, and there was a buy in there. That's why there's four weeks from weeks three to six. He missed three weeks with a hamstring injury, and then he sat out week 17. 
Outside of that, he was a beast. Very close to 1,000 total yards from scrimmage, 969, despite playing in just 12 games. And two of them, the one he got injured in and the one he returned from his injury from, he was very, very limited in terms of snap counts, right? They didn't play him. Either got hurt midway through the game or they didn't play him because it was his first week back from injury where he played fewer than 40% of the team's snaps. So if we do some extrapolation work, if we get the fucking big facts and we analyze them, we look at the games in which he was a, a normal full-time player in which we can expect him to be going forward. If we take out the two weeks where he played less than 40% of snaps, again, he got injured for one of them, so I don't want to count those against his stats. And then secondly, the one week he came back from the long-term injury, we've already done a study on this, and we know that running backs that come back from a multi-week injury always have limited, limited playtime and snap counts relative to the rest of the season numbers. So we take out weeks two, we take out weeks seven, and we are left with 10 games. Every other game, he played in at least two thirds of the snaps, which I think is reasonable to expect. A lot of people think that Frank Gore took so much work. He did only goal line work. That's really what he took away from from Singletary. In the games that Singletary was healthy, again, he played in 66% of the snaps. So if you look at that 10 game pace where he was healthy and playing his normal things of snaps and you push that out to 16 game pace, here are the numbers you're getting. 222 carries, 1,107 rushing yards, 63 targets, 47 receptions, 310 receiving yards. So we're looking at 269 touches overall, 1,417 yards from scrimmage. This does not include their playoff game where Singletary caught six of seven targets for 134 yards from scrimmage. That would absolutely run train on the rest of the numbers and his efficiency would be too high. We did not include the playoff game in that, but I think it's worth noting because he balled out in the playoffs in the game that they obviously trust him to be a big factor in. Again, though, going back to the goal line carries, man, that is where Singletary will either thrive or remain faceless in fantasy. Last year, Gore had 11 of the team's 18 goal line carries. Allen had five of the 18 and that leaves just two remaining, which is what Singletary got. Now, Allen being the player that he is, right, that big quarterback on the goal line will continue to get his share. But with Gore gone, I pray that Singletary gets them, man. He reminds me so much of Aaron Jones. Like, Jones has been the single most efficient back on the goal line since entering the NFL and inside the 10-yard line in terms of converting those carries into touchdowns. Everyone thinks that, like, I tweeted this out the other day, but people have such a, a bad viewpoint on, like, who is successful when it comes to scoring touchdowns. Everyone thinks that smaller backs are bad goal line backs, literally just because of their size. And everyone thinks that bigger wide receivers are better goal line wide receivers, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like when you look at the wide receivers that usually excel in the end zone, it's just as crucial, if not more important to be able to create space as a wide receiver. And the guys like the Antonio Browns, that's why they score so many damn touchdowns, because they're so good at creating space in a very minimal tight part of the field. Those guys are very good goal line receivers and goal line backs. And just being bigger, being bigger for both wide receivers and running backs does not equal being better on the goal line. The same way that creating space is good for wide receivers, the vision is just that important for these smaller running backs. And you see that of these guys like Aaron Jones and Devin Singletary. I mean, you go back to college, Aaron Jones averaged nearly a rushing touchdown per game in his career at UTEP because he's just simply good at scoring. But if you look at Singletary, he was exponential on that. The guy scored 12 rushing touchdowns his freshman season, 32 his sophomore year, 22 more his junior year. So you're looking at a whole fucking lot of rushing touchdowns throughout his career at college. Another guy that despite his stature is amazing at scoring. And some things aren't, aren't just as easy as like, regression or unlucky offensive line play like some guys are actually good at fucking scoring and Singletary is is one of them now they go ahead and draft AJ Dillon in the third round and everything I just said pretty much uh wasted my entire breath on. they were rumored to be looking at Melvin Gordon which tells you at worst even if they weren't serious about paying him any sort of money tells you that they would you like if they had signed him right say he they, he was just like, all right, fuck it. Nothing's working out. I'll take a two year, $8 million deal. And they signed him. They would use him, right? So it seems like they do want a committee when it comes to Singletary. But if Singletary can be the valuable piece of the committee, like Aaron Jones in Green Bay, it's going to be a very good second year for him. We already saw him get a ton of passing work. I don't think people realize how involved in the passing game he was, or at least like the weekly ceiling that he brought. So if you're looking at those that 10 game sample size that I keep referring to, Singletary saw six or more targets in four of the 10 games. So in 40% of the games, he was getting six or more targets. It's a ridiculous number of targets. In six of the 10 games, so 60% of the time, he caught three or more passes. You look at a guy like Singletary, if that's going to become the norm, a quick like three for 33 receiving line is, a, is an added, is a padded five extra half PPR fantasy points on the bottom line. So even if he's only rushing, you know, 12 carries for fucking 70 yards a game or something, and he does not score the goal line work, 
giving him that extra baseline of five half PR fantasy points gets him up to a floor of like 11 or 12 fantasy points per game. If he does get the goal line work, he's going to be a big time breakout this year in fantasy football. So that being said, I mean, you have to factor all those things again back into a into a spectrum form. I almost think it's a similar it's a similar situation to uh to what Miles Sanders has in Philly. And at this point, I would say that the Buffalo offense is probably they're probably a better offense all around. Way more weapons, way more personnel, probably just better talent overall. They want to run the ball a lot. Singletary's in a good spot. We'll have to see what they do in the draft and a lot can change obviously come next Thursday, come next Friday. We'll recircle, but I think it's important to get the general idea and the big facts out about these sophomore running backs who are going to be such an intriguing part of the analysis this offseason. Last one that I want to dive into on like a major scale is Darrell Henderson, Los Angeles Rams. Last year, he was the third round pick, 70th overall. He went before Singletary. He went before David Montgomery. Current ADP, 79th overall, the 607 running back 34. Gurley's gone, right? We know this. He's unfortunately in Atlanta with my Falcons. This opens up 223 carries, 31 receptions in that Rams backfield, but the Rams are clearly not committed to giving Henderson a girly like role, and they never were. I was never a fan of Henderson. I'll, I'll preface this by saying I was never a fan of Henderson. If you look at my write-ups on him last year, I thought he ran very straight up. I thought he was a very Tevin Coleman-like runner who could succeed in the right situation, right? He ran for like 1,900 yards his last year at college. And that's not something to be ignored. And he had so many big plays. It was like 70-yard touchdown run, 80-yard touchdown run, 80-yard touchdown reception. Like ridiculous shit that you do not see on an everyday college player's resume, even the elite college players, a breakaway speed. So he has legit NFL breakaway speed. But the offensive line that he had at Memphis was unbelievable. The holes that they, they gave him, when you're playing at Memphis again against lesser competition and you have an offensive line that gives you holes, guess what happens when you have real NFL speed? The other guys on the field don't have real NFL speed playing in Memphis's conference. So when you have four, four five speed and you get big ass holes, nobody's catching you. Can you do that in the NFL? No. That's why I did not like Henderson. He was not an elusive guy. He did not make guys miss. He made guys miss only through pure speed and he was not going to get that same shit. I said that if he landed on a team like LA who had a great offensive line would give holes, he would do well. Turns out their line was fucking trash this year. Really, really bad. That also needs to be factored into it. Like, do we see the offensive line improve? What what do we see going forward from the O-line? That's going to be a big part of whether or not Henderson can improve. But I see people like, I would rather take Malcolm Brown than Darrell Henderson at value. Guys, please don't fucking do that. We know what Malcolm Brown is at this point. He is... He's just not a good fucking fantasy football player. Here's the problem with value. Here's the fucking problem with value. Drafting at value. Oh, I'd rather take um, Malcolm Brown in the 14th round than Darrell Henderson in the 7th round. Why the fuck would you take Malcolm Brown in the 14th round when his upside is that of a 12th round return? There's no reason. I understand drafting from value. I understand the, the, the idea of value-based drafting. But when you're drafting a guy at RB50 whose upside is finishing at RB42, yes, listen, by all fucking calculations and by all mathematics, you drafted based on value. Congratulations. He didn't do a fucking thing for your fantasy team, though. The RB42 is never in your lineup. He is never one of the top scorers on your team. Yes, Malcolm Brown might end up with five goal line touches because he rumbles into the end zone. You are never starting that guy, okay? So, yes, there's a there's a reason for value, but when you're in a situation like this, guys, I, people need to get back from the numbers and, and stop thinking about value and think about real fucking life. If Malcolm Brown is drafted onto your team, there's not a single week in which you are starting him. He gives you no upside. So, yeah, you could draft a player who's wide receiver 55 and ends up as wide receiver 48, and guess what? You got some value out of it, some value that will never fucking help you win a fantasy football game ever. So stop talking about guys like Malcolm Brown who have zero ceiling even if you don't like Darrell Henderson, you are not taking Malcolm Brown over Darrell Henderson, even at a seven round discount. The only thing you're going to do is just not take a Rams running back. Don't take Malcolm Brown. Don't waste a fucking pick on a guy like Malcolm Brown. Waste a pick on a high upside receiver or some shit like that that could actually give you top 20 return or something at the position because there is no possible way in any case or any scenario in which Malcolm Brown returns top 20 running back fucking upside. Okay. Sorry, Malcolm. It wasn't personal. You just suck. Let's talk about Darrell Henderson last year. At no point, despite Gurley's limited role relative to previous years, did Henderson make a push for the backfield. In a single game, 11 carries were his season high, 14 total touches in a game. 
He finished the year with a miserable 39 for 147, zero rushing touchdown line, which is 3.7 yards per carry. He added four catches for 37 yards. They've already come out and said via Roto World, I will throw this up on the screen. I'm also using a new software to record this, which gives me a lot of flexibility. It's actually a lot of fun. Like I just like pop shit up on the beep bop, boop bop, and I could like fuck with the brightness and stuff. So if I want to... I can make myself red and blue. So this is my first time using it. So I'm sorry if I do some shit that makes it real weird. What was I even talking about? Oh, Darrell Henderson. We know is just not going to be utilized by the Rams as a workhorse. Their GM, despite getting rid of Gurley and not having even drafted someone, they want to utilize more than one guy getting the ball with different skill sets. So that right away tells you Henderson is never going to see that Gurley type upside, even if people want to project it based on the workload that he had in college. It's very, very possible and almost likely that the Rams end up taking uh, someone in the draft. But I think it is more likely that Henderson does lead the backfield in touches. That also doesn't mean fantasy success. Uh, the biggest problem, again, is that offensive line, right? When they were dominant back in 2018, it shit was so easy for the running backs. Uh, I would argue that like a, a good portion of Gurley's success, his elite fantasy success, just came straight from that offensive line. Sometimes it felt like he was literally playing football by himself on the field. Last year, 19th in run blocking per football outsiders, 26th per PFF, just one year, just a single year removed from being the number one run blocking line on both of those sites. Life comes at you fast, man. The only real piece they have cemented as a starter on the line this year is Whitworth. Again, they uh, they signed him to a three-year, $30 million extension. And let me tell you, he is not the same elite Whitworth he once was. He's still very, very good in pass blocking, but run blocking ranked 58th of 80 qualified tackles in 2019. The line is absolutely going to be a problem again. And given that they basically traded away all their first-round picks until the year like 2042, it's going to continue to be a problem. So Henderson, again, is a guy that needs a line to provide him holes. So I will absolutely not be taking Henderson in the sixth round of drafts. I think I would be a little bit more receptive to it if he started dropping to like the eighth and ninth round, because again, he is a back that's in a committee. They've already come out and say they want to use a committee and they were behind a bad offensive line. And we have no idea if he's getting any goal line work based on his size. You know, like I said, smaller backs can succeed on the goal line. But NFL coaches don't see it that way. They don't like to use it that way. They see a fat guy like Malcolm Brown. They might draft a guy like fucking A.J. Dillon. We don't know. I love how I like every time I talk about a team just drafting a fat running back, I just think about A.J. Dillon, even though he's not fat whatsoever. He's just, he, he's, he's thick as fuck though. He's thick though. He thick though. He got them big bones. So yeah, there, there's too many red flags for me to like Henderson without enough upside in the, in the sixth round. So Henderson, I'm probably out on this year unless his price drops. So again, this is for redraft. So there are other sophomore running backs that are probably worth touching on like Tony Pollard, Justice Hill, even like Damian Harris, if you really want to get fucking an, me annoyed on a goddamn Wednesday morning. So I'm not going to dive into him because I've already have enough stress in my life. I kind of like Travis Homer too. I think he's someone to keep an eye on depending on how the offseason goes and if the Seahawks address the running backs in the draft because we have an entirely banged up backfield of Chris Carson and Rashad Penny who tore his ACL in like week 13 of last year, week 14. So he's probably going to miss most of the season next year. I, and I think Travis Homer is a really interesting, interesting, interesting guy in that backfield. Tony Pollard and Justice Hill, like again, guys, like you can get excited uh, as as excited as you want about Tony Pollard. But at the end of the day, he is still a backup running back to one of the most volume heavy running backs in the NFL. Like there's no scenario in where Zeke stops getting work because they want to give more work to Tony Pollard. And if that's the case, his ceiling is so limited that I don't like really waste. At the end of the day, he's a handcuff, man. He's someone that you are going to probably be dropping after the first three weeks of an NFL season because he's getting six carries and three receptions. It's not something that you want in your running back slot in your fantasy football lineups. I tend to stay away from guys like that. Unless I own Zeke, then yeah, I'm going to be targeting a guy like Tony Pollard. But like, I think the hype is going to get to the point where people are like, yeah, he's going to run so many routes and he's going to be a weapon in this offense. Like, it's Mike McCarthy. He ain't that fucking creative. I know they did a lot with like Randall Cobb, but Randall Cobb's a wide receiver. Of course, they're going to fucking throw him the ball a lot. Uh, so that's my spiel on it. Those are the five guys that I think we really need to dive into to give a little bit more context behind the rookie years and what we can expect going into their sophomore seasons. Josh Jacobs, love him. Miles Sanders, love the player. Not sure I love the price right now. Montgomery, don't think he needs to be left for, left for dead, but based on early drafts, I don't like where he's going. 
Devin Singletary is a guy I'll probably dabble with depending on what they do in the draft. Late third round, I think he's sort of like a discount Miles Sanders in terms of like his involvement in the passing game. Darrell Henderson, absolutely not in the sixth round. And you got some other guys that are intriguing, but I think for just straight redraft purposes, I don't know how much they really, really, really intrigue me. So all we got for y'all today, not today, not today. It's all we got for you for this video, but make sure you come back 12 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Eastern time, and 5 p.m. Eastern time. We are interviewing the interns, the final round of the application process. It'll be fun. It'll be live. We'll get these fucking kids in a, in a spiral. We'll get their brains turned into mush today. It's going to be fun. We'll have some special guest interviewers. So make sure you come back. Uh, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing everything fantasy football for the rest of our lives. And let me know again how you like the setup. I could always go back to the, to the other angle. That's it for today. Love y'all.